We did this. Oh, right I found the it. Computer. Got it. So All right. Well, let's just start. Uh, Chris Dawkins is an incredible guy. He is both a engineer and a humanitarian beyond belief. Um, I have worked with Chris now for a couple of years, and he has worked with big and small firms. Um, and he is now the principal, one of the principals at Beach Consulting down in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, he is a member of our executive committee. Uh, what what uh, vice president are you? The second vice I'm, president? I'm, I'm secretary treasurer right now. Oh, secretary treasurer right now. But in March, he'll become the second vice president as he moves his way up to be president of IBEC uh, in a few years. But uh, anyways, Chris, thank you so much for putting this of together course. for us. Of course. Have you guys got, I've got a little icon on my screen that says this meeting is being recorded, but. Yeah, you just have to accept that. All right. Well, somehow I don't want to screw this up. I'm just going <laughs> to let it roll. I I know I, I can see I, I've got two screens up, a big one and a little one. So I'm going to use the little one. Here we go. So this is uh, just a fast, uh, we burned some time figuring out technical. Thank you all for putting up with that. But um, here's, here's what we're going to discuss briefly. Um, how water gets into buildings, release is not, we're not going to discuss. We're really going to focus on the intrusion and generation uh, from airflow. Those are what we're going to focus on here. But of course, water gets into buildings when you have a plumbing leak or something like that. Um, mo the, these are terms you need to get in your head when you're com for coming to the um, uh, convention. Uh, these are like the three ways that, that uh, water enter enters systems. And the first one is easy, bulk water. That's a leak, you know, just a pure leak. Uh, I, I sometimes refer to that as free water. Um, a lot of folks refer to it as bulk water, and I've tried to improve my, make my vocabulary work that. So that's just liquid. It's just good old water. If you got a leak either through the waterproofing, which we're going to talk about here in a second, or assemblies like through a window or, you know, through some other, something other than the waterproofing that's on the wall or the roof. Um, so you've got, and then the second one is a big one, and that's unconditioned air. Um, if there, you think about high humidity places, you guys are from all over the country, I'm guessing, but in the South, you know, during the fall uh, and summer and spring months, we have a lot of humidity in the, in the air. And if, that's, if that can work its way into places it shouldn't be, um, within interior spaces, you can have just multitudes of problems that look like leakage, but they're not. They're actually hey, condensation. Yes, sir. Chris, the slide hasn't changed. I know. I, I, I oh, okay. Yeah. And then the final way, you should be seeing the slide says bulk water, unconditioned air, and diffusion, right? Uh, Chris, I think it's because <clears throat> when you shared your screen, when you went full screen with the uh, the presentation, um, we're still looking at the original, like, small screen PowerPoint. Um, there you go. Okay, got it. All right. Let's see if this works. What you got now? Bulk water. Good. That's what I was, that's the slide I was talking um, from. I, I think that when you set it to full screen on your laptop, it's not processing because like you said, you had two screens. So I think it might be messing up. So it may need to just do it in the normal PowerPoint without full screen. Like this? Yeah. Oh, good grief. Okay. Is that okay? Like this. Y'all are seeing this now. Yeah, that works. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me back up then. So so this, y'all were sitting there. I thought I thought y'all were seeing my screen. Okay, so you're seeing this now, right? Yes. Okay, everybody good? Yeah, this is a test of my patience. Um, okay, sources of water. Release, we're not gonna talk about a lot, but that's, you know, good old plumbing breaks inside a building, floods, you know, any, uh, and then intrusion and, 
and airflow, uh, you know, water intrusion into buildings via airflow. That's what we're going to be focusing on today, okay? So I've got a release slide coming, but I want you to really understand this slide is very important. This is what I was talking from without the slide a second ago, y'all right? Y'all right? are seeing it. Modes of uncontrolled leakage, correct, at the top? Yes. Good, okay. Bulk water, that's liquid. That, that basically is, you know, coming th coming through a, an assembly such as a window. That's easy to easy to uh, visualize, or it's a leak through the waterproofing that then is causing, um, you know, a, a leak into the into a wall assembly or into a roof assembly. That's 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 low hanging fruit, but it happens all the time. Uh, unconditioned air is a little little more technical but it's not really, it's basically a leak through an air barrier. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more as we go forward. But basically, as I said, as I said before y'all could see the slide, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. We have about nine months of high humidity, uh, you know, here in Atlanta. If, if unconditioned air gets into the wall assemblies, it can basically condense, cause condensation problems on the interior because, because of um, all the unconditioned air that's not supposed to be in the assembly. And that's what air barriers are for. And then the final way is, is pretty high math. That's diffusion. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but you need to understand it. It's basically the migration of moisture from one side of a material through the other. So like if, you're, if you got a wall sheathing, on an exterior wall, we'll, we'll, uh, there'll be some pictures of that in a minute. Um, basically, you might have you know high moisture on the exterior side that's going to basically diffuse through the material and then come come out the interior side, and which can then humidify the wall cavity and cause all kinds of problems. So I want you to really understood that you take screenshots of some of this stuff so you can get it. But bulk water unconditioned air and diffusions are sort of your modes of of how water you know travels through an, uh, buildings um, here's some other concepts i want you to really understand um, we talk about wrbs all the time in our business whether that's a weather resistant barrier some people call it a water resistant barrier um, both both work and that's basically you know, what keeps, it's a tape, a building wrap or a fluid applied product. I'm, I'm thinking of walls right now. A roof is a WRB, if you think about it. Um, the, whether the, the, that barrier may be on the exterior, right at the exterior, such as a roof, or there's uh, wall assemblies like a log cabin or a block wall, painted block wall in a warehouse. Those are the barriers on the exterior. Most of, most of the wall systems y'all and, and I deal with or have a, have a barrier that's behind the cladding of some form. If you don't understand what cladding is, that's like brick or siding. I, I'm not sure what y'all's level of expertise is, but wall claddings are basically what you see um, and most of them have a WRB behind them, but some are indeed the barrier. So you, you, I think hopefully you're getting that with this dialogue. Air barrier is similar. It basically stops uncon unconditioned air from getting into um, the assembly. And then, and then at the bottom there, I'm saying, hey, sometimes those are those are one and the same up in the north. There's typically an air barrier and a, and a WRB uh, down here in the south. They're, they're one and the same. They're, used, they're on the exterior of the wall. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping you really are gathering and back up, gather those three modes of, of, my, of how liquid, you know, enters an assembly and then understand we're talking about the WRB and the AB. I, 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 I'll refer to them as the air barrier and the weather barrier quite a bit. Um, here's your only release photo, but also don't forget about 
uh, you know, you can have a plumbing leak, but you also a lot of times will have drains, i.e. think about a roof. So sometimes you'll have a, a roof drain that doesn't, doesn't perform correctly and you'll get typically good old release right into the ceiling of a, or the, uh, you know, attic space of a, of a building because of a, of a drain problem, not necessarily a barrier problem. Fundamentals, gravity always prevails. I think y'all all know that, that's low hanging fruit. But don't forget about how water can wick. Basically you get some water down, typically in buildings it'll run to the slab or the, or the lowest level. And then it'll start wicking into the materials that are in contact with the slab. A big one is wind driven rain, uh, a 50 mile an hour wind, which is not hard for us to, you know, once you get into a 10, 10 story building or more, you're going to, you, that building will see 50 mile an hour wind all the time. Um, wind driven rain basically can push water uphill or up a wall. A 50 mile an hour wind will typically push wall, push a water up the wall about two inches. So if you've got a cap, say at a parapet wall assembly, that's not well sealed or not very, uh, not well sealed or not um, tall enough, you basically can push water right under that cap and into the wall assembly that's, that the cap is covering. That's really a big deal. Debris within drainage assemblies or at, or at roof drains or the, there's places I've got some pictures. So we'll talk about that as we go. So basically debris or slow, slow drainage increases the possibility of leakage. Uh, roofs are not designed to, to be swimming pools. Walls are not designed to hold water anywhere. So, so those, are, those are the big ones. The biggest one there is wind-driven rain. Uh, basically, don't forget about that. And you know, if you're down in Florida, buildings are designed to 130, 150 mile an hour winds in the, here in Atlanta. The, the building code requires us to, to design to 90 miles per hour. And remember 50 mile an hour wind will push it up two inches, 90, 90 mile an hour wind, wind would be like if we had a hurricane or something like that here in Atlanta, uh, that would might push it about four inches. So we're designing, we should be designing to 90 to 130, 140 miles an hour, depending on where we are. So don't forget about that, that's huge. Um, we're going to talk briefly about roof types. Uh, IBEX started as the Roof Consultants Institute, so roofs were a big deal, and they still are a big part of our culture and what building enclosure people work on. So you basically have steep slope, uh, that's shingles, uh, metal systems, wood shakes, slate, clay tile, those types of systems that you see. Anything, say, higher than 212 pitch is considered steep slope. Um, low slope can be purely flat. It, 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 nothing is exactly flat, but basically a flat roof to a, say a 112, half 12 pitch roof. And that's gonna be built up. You don't see a ton of that today, but that's uh, multiple high-end paper and hot tar that are plied together in a, you know, basically four ply, three ply system. What you see more of today is everything below. Uh, modified bitumen is used quite a bit in institutional uh, settings. Single membrane systems, the EPDM, the PVC, and the TPO are absolutely the most prevalent and popular systems right now. Spray polyurethane foam you might see in, in some places, and then metal systems that I've discussed up above are, um, are um, used in low slope assemblies as well. You'll sometimes see a half, you know, half inch to 12 inch uh, sloped metal system, just like, just like you would see it in a steep slope setting in some others. So those, those are, that's a brief overview of roofs. Uh, roof flashings, uh, you, under, you need to understand what a base flashing is. A base flashing is basically the tie between the main roof and a wall. Um, so that's what, that's basically, we'll, we'll have some photos here in a minute, but that's basically how, basically the transition of a wall to a roof 
Uh, you'll also uh, have step flashings. I'll show you the photos of that in a minute. And then a cap flashing would be typically a, a metal upside down U, right? That would just lay over the top of, of course, be attached to the top of say a parapet wall. So those are, those are just kind of basic. You'll hear people say base flashing a lot. People go, what is that? Well, think about the base of a wall and, and the flashing that ties the roof to that base. And you, that maybe that helps you understand it. Uh, failure modes of roofs. Let's talk about that as we, um, as we look at photos, but these are, you can screenshot that um, if you'd like. And that, and that will give you a little, you know, we're, we'll talk about some of the failures as we look at some photos. Uh, this is a typical shingle roof. This is an, apart, this is an apartments uh, here, in a, here in the Atlanta area. Typical roof, you can see the, um, yeah, I've got using my screen, there's a, there's a roof valley, right? Here's a ridge, here's a lower edge. I, I often refer to that as the lower edge. Uh, sometimes folks will refer to that as the eave. Um, and these are all, you know, places you can get leaks. Here's a roof to wall. So there's a step, there should be a step flashing under the, under the shingle or integrated with the shingle and then turning up that wall, like a 90 degree little L flashing that's laid down uh, with the roof. So this is, if you're, at, some of you guys are in the north, you could never do this in the north like this. Basically, here and this is here in Georgia, so the uh, the siding material is coming almost flush with the roof. Uh, it, up north, you'd get you'd get ice dams or whatnot in there, and it'd break that siding loose. We get away with it here in Georgia. Down here at the base of that wall, there should be a flashing to divert the water away from the wall. We'll talk about that a little bit going forward. But that's the typical roof to wall termination you might see. In a steep slope, in a steep slope setting. Whoops, what am I doing here? Uh, hold on. Okay, this is a a really good shot of what's called a diverter flashing, and this this um, applies to both commercial and uh, residential type settings. It also applies um, in low slope. And basically, the, basically at the base of a wall, anytime you got a wall up here, up, up high, and of course that wall is continuing down vertically below the roof edge, um, you've got to have some kind of a flashing that turns turns the water away from the wall where the roof ends. Otherwise, you've got sort of a hole in the wall, and um, and water can run right in the hole. You'd, you'd be amazed how often this gets left out of construction almost daily. So when we're going to figure out why water's in a building, this is one of the first places we look at. As we look at some photos going forward, I'll point those out to you. Um, here's a roof valley. Uh, that's a, a, a very suspect location. If, um, if flashings aren't done correctly at valleys, because you got two, you know, two uh, slopes converging at the valley. And if that is not flashed at the base of that valley, you'll get a leak. Uh, this is a good, a good um, graphic, uh, just graphic kind of showing how the flashing should be laid in before the shingles go on. So this is the shingles. This is a, a underlayment that goes under the shingles. And then here's the flashing at the valley. So uh, vent boots are a huge problem. Basically, sh shingles are designed to last, say, 20, between 20 and 30 years, depending on the manufacturer and the thickness of the shingle and all those types of things. But vent boots only last about 10 years. So uh, this, I thought this is a great photo. I, I took that photo. So sometimes it's not the roof, it's just the penetrations. Here's another, here's another good shot of a roof to wall down below there. There's no kick out flashing there, by the way. Um, here's, if you guys want to screenshot this and want to re-roof your house one day, this is how you do a vent assembly correctly. Um, but that's a huge, that's often a huge leak source on, on a you know, steep slope roofing. Uh, this is eave detail, basically a rake. The rake is the is the side that's sloped 
and the eave is the, is the is the side that's flat. So the eave is at the base of the roof line. The rake is coming down the line. This is if the if you don't have flashings, proper flashings at your eave, and at your rake, then water can blow up. Think about that wind driven we were talking about earlier. It can blow up under the shingle and then get into the wall or or ceiling area because because there's no flashing at these edges. So that's very important. Low slope, we're flying low here. Um, low slope roofs, we'll talk about this from photos as well, but um, essentially anything, low slope, think about it, they're already flat. So water is gonna travel very slowly. Um, if you have, you know, drainage issues, if you're ponding water, if, if flashings are not right, then basically you could have a flashing wrong adjacent to a pond. Those, those would get found pretty quickly. We'll talk about this from the photos. This is a gravel ballasted uh, low slope roof. Uh, typical, this looks like mod, modified bitumen. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see some photos here in a second. Um, you see the roof drains here. You see vent assemblies that you know, go through, penetrate the roof. And then if you, I, I like this photo for a lot of reasons. One is it just shows you a typical commercial roof. But when we're talking about how water gets into buildings, uh, we've got the base flashings, but here we've got a wall above a roof. So in a wedding cake kind of building apparatus, you've got a lot of walls above roofs and what, you know, an owner may be going, I've got a roof leak. When I say, well, you see that hole in that wall right there. Um, no, you, you've got a wall leak that's above your roof. So um, these are this is what things we do. That's a great shot of a base flashing. So now you've now you got a mental, you know, a good picture of it. Um, this is a modified bitumen material. Looks kind of like a shingle, but it's much thicker. You see, of course, you got your lap seams about every three feet. So if that's not done well, that that's a good entry point. Um, and then this is a stucco wall above, and then there's a, a weep, there should be a weep as assembly under, you know, at the base of that stucco that's tied to this, to this flashing assembly that's over the top of the mod bit. So uh, hopefully that makes good sense. So here's some gravel ballast here down below. Um, there's another shot of the roof of that same roof. There's a pond, you know, these, these photos were picked uh, for, for this presentation, but this happens every day. So plug drain, that's not good. That'll probably cost some water. Oh, a hole, yeah, it'll cost some water. I think this is the more, more, most important picture. That's why I blew by the others. Um, the, I took this photo after a windstorm on a, on a roof uh, here in, in the Augusta, Georgia area. It shows you two things. One is um, you see how they, they brought the, the base flashing up and just stopped it right at the top. That should be wrapped over into a hole. If this was a parapet wall, let's say this is a parapet wall at the edge of a roof, then the same, same principle applies. You bring the roofing up, up the vertical wall and then lap it fully into and over that so basically, if you if you look at this before the roof storm, this wasn't well attached because this wasn't a big windstorm that caused this. But you see this hole for this uh, for this uh, electrical cable entering the vent. It wasn't sealed. If water blew in there during during before this happened, if, you know, like over at this one right here, if water blew in at that point, it would just naturally run right behind the roof and down into the assembly. And that's why you've got to, you've got to wrap, you, know, you got to think about how everything integrates with its, with each uh, basically assembly on the roof. So I've always liked this picture because it shows how not to do a, a, a curb. And if you take a look at roofs, you got curbs everywhere. Um, this is a pitch pocket. You'll hear that term used Basically, how do you how do you run pipes through a roof? Well, you run pipes and utility systems through a box such as this, and then you fill that with uh, a waterproof um, mastic caulk, heavy duty, 
but see what happens is they're not maintained. This one's maintained in an average manner and they'll start, you'll start getting leaks where the, where the, basically the, the tar or the pitch gets, gets old and worn out. But the other place that you'll have entry is sometimes through, you know, this is a pipe or you'll have a conduit or something like that that will actually have a leak in it and just purely bypass the pitch pocket. But this is, this is basically, you'll hear that term a lot when you're dealing with roofs because that's how uh, basically pipes and utility systems are going to penetrate the roof typically through a pitch pocket, something like this. Uh, let's see, I keep uh, opening the, all right, this is a, this is called a roof scupper. Um, here's a roof drain that's basically a vertical pipe under that assembly that's carrying the water. Uh, this is, this is a roof scupper that's, that's in place so that if this drain gets clogged, uh, water would rise up and go out of the scupper rather than basically if it keeps rising, it'll you know, collapse the roof, put too much weight on it. So that's an emergency drain. Sometimes scuppers are the primary drain, but this is what's going on here. This is a single membrane roof. Uh, this is heat welds right here. This is probably a TPO. It could be a PVC. They look pretty similar. EPDM roofs are typically uh, the same kind of uh, construction, different different rubber material. The PVC refers to the polyvinyl chloride. TPO, I can't, I can never remember the, the um, <clears throat> chemical composition. They're basically rubbers. EPDM is the, is the, is the chemo, is the uh, chemical, uh, there's a long, long organic chemistry. Uh, uh, we just call it EPDM. So anyway, that's, sort of what you got, but this is just showing you typical roof drain, whoops, I went the wrong way, typical roof drain, typical scupper. Um, at, before we leave the scupper, if you think about it, that's gotta be integrated properly with this wall. And then on the exterior of that wall is a wall cladding and a waterproofing system behind that wall cladding. That's that hole through that wall has got to be properly uh, tied together from a waterproofing system. And if, if you, if you heard me refer to a parapet wall a minute ago, this is a parapet wall, basically a wall at the roof edge, very common practice. Uh, some of y'all may know all this stuff already. If you don't, that's the reason we're here. So, uh, you can see a base flashing here. You can see, um, some kind of a, Transition between the stucco. This looks like a stucco and uh, this, the waterproofing behind the stucco wall tying to the base flashing. I've got some better pictures of that later. Sometimes roof, sometimes roof leaks are not roof leaks. They are leaks such as this. I think the next photo is, I took this about two or three weeks ago over in South Carolina. So basically, and I, we were trying to figure out the, the, um, sources of water leakage into this building. They say, oh, our roof's leaking. And I said, well, it looks like a roof leak down below. Speaking of which, there's a pitch pocket right there, y'all. Um, but you could see all this prior work's been done on the HVAC system above the roof that comes down through the vents. Looks like a roof leak. It's not a roof leak. It was a you know, utility system, HVAC system leak. Um, so I'm showing you kind of the greatest hits of um, why sometimes roofs leak. I thought this was interesting. This was at the same roof. You can see it was a mix of low slope and steep slope. And then they'd run these vents right through the, just right through the shingle roofs. And um, there was a ton of leakage down below there. And they were like, we got leaks. And I, went, I got on the roof. It's like, yeah, you sure do. <laughs> this is awful. You can see here's a pipe penetration that they've tried to do here. That's an improper uh, vent boot right here. And then of course they're trying to punch this uh, duct system straight into the roof. So like I say, greatest hits. This is another problem. This is a chimney. You deal with this in commercial settings. You deal with this and this is a commercial roof. This is over a healthcare facility. 
um, but it is steep slope, so it could feel residential. Um, but basically, brick is porous. The mortar joints are more porous. And so for that reason, they, they uh, allow water to enter behind the brick. And you can see this flashing is, is basically, they've caulked over whatever weep system is at the base of that brick. And then the only thing keeping water out is really this caulk joint. So as soon as that caulk joint goes, we've got water behind, basically behind the flashing, behind the roof and leaking into the building. So this is a transition at a wall. Can you see the hole? You can, should be able to see kind of a hole there. Um, you know, these are basics. Same, same principle as the chimney we just looked at a second ago. Uh, remember brick and mortar are porous. So there's gotta be something to weep the water that you know is gonna get through that out. They've covered those weeps up and then they put this supplemental flashing up that's installed incorrectly. Um, and then of course they also don't have a cap on the on, on top. So what basically we had a lot of leakage under this location and and they thought it was storm damage. And, I, and so I went up and I said, well, the storm that you're concerned about certainly got water into the building, but you've been getting water into the building during every other storm too. And there were tons of ceiling repairs indicating this had been going on a long time, but this should have a cap flashing over it. That's just porous brick. So when we're, when we're out there um, investigating, uh, we use meters uh, of all kinds. This is a non-intrusive meter. They're great tools, uh, but you need to know how to use them. Uh, and the biggest takeaway is you must know what's, you must have some knowledge of what's under it. These will give you false negatives and they'll also give you false positives. If you don't know what you're looking at under them, they're once you understand what's under an assembly, this applies to walls and roofs. Once you understand what's under it, these are fantastic tools for getting um, a lot of work done. There's some big leak detection systems I don't have time to tell you about uh, today, uh, but it, when you're at the convention, you'll see these roller um, assemblies that you can roll. It's like, it looks like a lawnmower. You can roll on the roof and do leak detection with those. But the big takeaway is you must know what's under them. Uh, fast, fast story we were working on. We were using a, a meter like this on walls in uh, Savannah, Georgia, probably about 15 years ago or so. And uh, a, a fellow uh, consultant was using a meter similar to this and he was getting positives all over interior walls. And I was like, there's no way that's right. And we were able to cut and so we cut, we cut, actually cut some wallpaper off the wall and then held his moisture meter up to the wallpaper and the wall, the glue, the wallpaper glue was causing the meter to go, I got water, <laughs> but the walls were dry as a bone. So case in point, you know, you got to know what you're putting this non-intrusive meter on before you use it, but they're tremendous tools once you get started. Uh, this is um, a guy right here is holding an infrared camera. Tremendous, again, tremendous tool, but you got to know what you're sh shooting at. That's an infrared um, photo of, of what he's looking at. And basically it's going to pick up the variations in color or variations in temperature, which, you know, water is either going to be cooler than the, the rest of the area or hotter than the rest of the area, depending on the situation. I've got some good IR photos coming up a little bit later in the um, presentation, but this gives you a feel. How are we doing on time, Rick? It's 2.52. Um, walls. Let's talk about walls a little bit. Here's, here's why the building and closure um, industry exists today as far as consulting and design. I love this slide because it basically shows you what went on, you know, 150 years ago to present. So essentially, uh, early walls were mass masonry, such as that on the left. And then around the 30s, they shrunk them down a little bit. 
um, but still the same concept existed. Basically, um, walls in, in the earliest days um, were just mass masonry. The water would soak in, um, soak in here. The left is exterior in these photos, right? Um, so soak in and then evaporate out. And there was enough mass, basically enough mass in the wall to us to, uh, to, to basically take care of that. Um, we, over time, the, they shrunk down a little bit um, because there might be a structure system in here. Basically, walls got um, smaller and smaller as as basically heights have gone higher and higher. This is a, this is more your typical view in a in a commercial construction job, um, or this could be residential or commercial. Basically, you have a foundation slab right here and a ceiling somewhere up here, and this is basically in, infill uh, studs uh, in commercial. You know, be a light gauge, you know, steel stud in residential. Uh, and some commercial, actually. This could be wood studs, an airspace, a cladding, a wall sheathing on the outside of the studs, and then maybe a drywall on the inside. Well, think about now the water is only, today is only, uh, you know, two inches from this wall sheathing. So if you've got a, if you've got a problem with your wall sheathing or your waterproofing that's, you know, outside your water, excuse me, you're waterproofing just outside your wall sheathing and you only have two inches of, of play and you, you know, probably have a little So um, that's why we're here, right? Um, and this is, I've, I've covered some of this already. I mean, basically it's lighter construction, wood, that's not, the, you know, wood will soak up water, uh, you know, stone and whatnot didn't back in the day. We're insulated. We've got uh, HVAC systems going on on the interior side. So we'll talk some more about that going on. Uh, we're going to talk about the vapor retarders and, and uh, which is also the WRB we're talking about. So keep going. Uh, drainable system has the WRB. That's why I put that at the beginning of the, of the presentation. I, I didn't want this to be the first time you heard that term. You, you get, basically got the drainage plane is going to be the outer surface of the WRB. The drainage space might be that air space between the back of the wall cladding. Wall cladding could be brick, siding, stucco, uh, some kind of panel system. Name, it doesn't matter. That's the cladding. That's whatever you see when you look at the exterior of the wall. The drainage space is what's behind that. The drainage plane is the outer surface of the WRB. And we've talked a little bit about flashings already. Flashing is basically what ties one part of the waterproofing assembly to the other. Uh, and then, of course, we may have an air barrier. Um, here in the southeast, the, the air barrier and the water barrier, or the WRB, are the same. Um, and then I, I'm trying to keep this... Uh, not uh, high level and not down into the details. So here's a, this is a brick assembly. Um, and this is a, you know, I'm hoping y'all are screenshotting some of this to help you help yourself. But basically here's your wall cladding. But again, I was trying, I want you to understand the principle, not get stuck on brick or something. That could be hardy plank, uh, lap siding or wood siding or stucco. There could be a lot of things here. The difference between brick and um, some of the others is sometimes this airspace is not two inches. This happens to be showing you brick, but you can see how everything should be lapped. This uh, WRB should be lapped over the flashing. You'd be amazed how many times the WRB gets put up, you know, two months before the brick mason shows up. So the brick mason shows up and actually puts this weep assembly on the outside of that, um, literally pushes it right up to the face of this um, WRB, which might be a Tyvek. But again, that could be a fluid applied system. Um, and this, this particular drawing is showing an air barrier and a, and a uh, vapor barrier, two different setups. 
that's not every day. That's not every day. Typically, this is this is both. But I'm hoping you're understanding the principles basically here. This is a this is a, a isometric view of basically this, what we just looked at. Um, here's your WRB, which they're calling a waterproof membrane. This is this is nice. shows you shows it in both isometric and and a section cut. This is the flashing. That then weeps weeps that out. But like I say, this is for brick and block, but the principles are the same for any cladding. There should be basically a WRB that appropriately laps over a flashing and a flashing that takes water out at the base of the wall. I think the next photo, this is out of a Northwest Wall and Ceiling Bureau. This is basically showing you the same, same concept for a stucco wall see this is this is your stucco out here um let's see yeah this is the lath that's the metal lath that the stucco is you know basically plastered to this is your this is your wrb and northwest wall and ceiling bureau really likes two layers instead of one some of the some codes require that for different assemblies. And then basically you can see um, they've got this one lap behind, but then you've got the main drainage plane is lapping over the face of this sweep assembly right here, which would then let, you know, water, make any water that got behind the stucco cladding um, exit out at the bottom. I think th here's you another section view of the same thing. These are great, these are great screenshots, by the way. Um, I'll try to keep my mouse out of the way. So we've already talked about this a lot. So I'm gonna skip skip this slide because last time we went over and we lost some time because of my technical issues. But basically we've talked about this already. Um, this is an important slide, caulk is an air barrier, it stops air, it, it, sup, it, it helps restrict water flow, but it's not typically uh, a water barrier, it's an air barrier. <clears throat> there are a few cases where, where caulk is indeed the water barrier, but that's not the norm. Uh, windows and doors, uh, they leak. So accordingly, you've gotta have some kind of flashing systems uh, around the perimeter of windows and doors to control the leakage that's going to happen either what you call if you got if you're putting in a window system you've got what's called around that system a rough opening right and then the window is basically inserted into that rough opening you must flash the rough opening must be flashed um, uh, transition points or, or corners, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go forward. Um, and then, of course, you know, let's say I've got a picture here in a second of a, like about a 15 foot window. Well, you know, some of the assemblies that you use for flashings are only 10 feet long, so you're gonna have a you're gonna have a joint somewhere in your flashing. So these are things that you know sometimes we show up and. And the problem is that there's a lap joint, you know, three feet under the under a window, and it wasn't either uh, lapped right or wasn't sealed right, and bingo, you know, there's there's your leak. Um, corners corners are typically a big problem. Um, these are showing you. So this is this, these are showing you some various concepts for how you know not to or how to properly pan flash under, basically um, you got a window assembly sitting on top of, you know, framing, and then you've got to properly flash that rough opening. This is, this is showing you a bad one. Um, there should be a flashing system. This is not the best picture in the world, but I've got better ones coming. Um, basically it's a window assembly sitting in a rough opening that's been clad with brick. Typically there's a flashing under that window that, that goes down over this, this course of brick and weeps out of tubes down below this. So this is 
that's not the best picture. This is an excellent picture. So here's, this happens to be a storefront window system. And you see, it's got its own weep assembly right here, right? So it's designed if water is gonna get in that window system and leak out of the, this little drain hole here, but all of that entire system is sitting in a rough opening. And accordingly, there needs to be a flashing, which this is right here, a flashing that tie, goes under that entire system. So basically you can have leaks, this is stucco. So basically you have leaks in the stucco, or you have leak at this caulk joint, it's gonna let water in the rough opening. And that's what this flashing does below. This weep hole is integral and built into the window system. It's taking care of the water that gets in to the window, metal to metal joints, or you know, the gaskets, whatever. They know they're gonna leak. So they've got this integral built into the window system, but then there's a second flashing under you know, under the entire assembly that's basically taking care of any water that gets into the rough opening. So hopefully I've not lost you there. Oops, let's see. This is that window I was telling you about. This is on a 23-story building. We just finished work doing a lot of third-party observation on. So basically you can see I've got a I've got a whole different drainage assembly up here where basically the upper window that's almost you know virtually out of the photo, but there's one over here, you know, laps at a at a slab edge right right here and right there. You got to think about the drainage of that slab edge, but we're we're looking right here. The concepts are the same. Um, that's th this is that same window, right? And this is a, just another shot. Why do I have more more than one picture of this in it? Because this is so important. So basically, you see that you see the weep system for the window itself. And this was in process. We were not finished. We were um, we were basically tying uh, the flashing from this rough opening over this cornice that was at the bottom of this window. <clears throat> I took this photo during construction, but basically, we were in the process of doing the work, but I thought this photo showed it well. Here's, by the way, we talked about weep at the base. That's a weep assembly at the base of the stucco wall here with a caulk joint under it. But the any water that gets into the stucco is gonna leak out of this weep right here that I'm running, whoops, I just started moving my photo. Um, so there's your weep for your stucco. Here's your uh, rough opening flashing here. When you get to Houston, you might be sitting in a into a, in a presentation where they're just talking about this, sort of like I am now. But at least this will be that'll be your second time. So this is a this is a great view of how a, how a rough opening should be flashed with a window. You see this this sill pan right here is what we've been looking at photos of. I think actually this photo is that's your that's your sill pan, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, that no, that is your sill pan. And then, and then the window is sitting in it. And this is very important. You'll hear the term end dam. That's this, this, this component right here. That's an end dam. It's keeping water from running out the side of the flashing and then a back dam to keep it from running to the interior. If this was just a flat piece of metal, the water, water that got in could just run off the side or or into the interior. So that's, I've always, this is a gelled wind detail. Gelled wind is a manufacturer of windows, fantastic company, I, I think. And that's why they, they made this, they made the cut here because they their their installation instructions are so clear. So that's how how um that should be done. This is this is another view of that same kind of flashing. And, and sometimes in commercial construction, you, you you know, the designer will build this in, you know, your, your flashing is going to sit right here, but they've shaped this particular uh, cast stone piece to, to take that. So um, this is, this is happens to be a caulk joint and a brick wall at a, basically brick walls have to have a control joint about every 30 feet. So this is, you can see this caulk's pretty worn out. Remember what I told you, that's an air barrier. 
it's it's going to limit water getting in, but it's not. That's not keep the main. That's not the main um, waterproofing. The main waterproofing is behind the brick. Air barrier, very important um, because of what we talked about. Remember that first slide or second slide I showed you. We're talking about free water, bulk water, but the passage of air through an assembly can take all the humidity that's being carried by that air to places that you don't want in the building. So you've got to have that air barrier. Um, that can be, I've, I've in this case mentioned Tyvek house wrap, but all of those, all of those joints of that wrap must be taped to, to the air barriers, one solid assembly. Uh, there's a lot of fluid applied uh, water and air barriers out on the market now. So basically you got a wall, you got a wall sheathing before you install your cladding, you basically get the air barrier over it. Um, this is why this is so important. This is a wonderful slide. And back in the day we were RCI, um, but there was a study uh, by the Building Science Corporation. I think their uh, website is buildingscience.org. There are fantastic source um, of information on what we do along with our technical library. Um, they did a study um, where they basically put a one, one, a, a one square inch hole into a wall assembly and then they and then they had another assembly without it. And so this was during the winter winter season. Uh, up north, so it's it's warm and humid uh, inside, right? And it's uh, cold outside. So basically, it's going to be natural drive, essentially from wet to dry, and from hot and humid to um, cold and dry. So basically, this is sort of diffusion we were talking about earlier. Earlier, so without the hole. And with that, and and with this this variable, you know, outside and inside air are different, and the moisture inside and outside are different. Uh, over a six month period, a third of a quart diffused. Remember diffusion. That's basically migration through the material diffused through that material. Well, your air conditioning and heating systems, all that could would handle that, right? But with you know, so they, they basically, it was a scientific lab study that basically with a one inch square hole, you know, as in an air leak, uh, 30 quarts of water in six months came through. And this is, think about this, this is only um, a four by eight sheet. So how many four by eight sheets are there on a, on a wall? So if you got a bunch of holes in the wall, think about how much water is essentially coming through via air. So I've, I've always loved this slide because it, it yeah, I think it presents that well. Um, uh, so basically, if you've got whole air leaks, then you, so that's, that's all good. Now you add things to it that, that make it worse. And wind, you think of a mid rise or a high rise building, they're always subject to wind. So you're going to basically be pushing, you basically be pushing air at a higher rate through those same holes in your air barrier. So this is huge. Um, this is a great slide that shows you, you know, you ba basically have an opening for an electrical receptacle or a um, utilities penetration. These are showing you, you know, air pathways as well as just good old pure diffusion here. So th this is how, how, do, how does air leak into a wall? Right here, you know, because basically the air barrier's got to be integrated properly with whatever, whatever, whatever penetrations are in the wall. And this is important. You know, if you read, um, if you go to the airport websites to find out what the wind speed was, the wind speed is measured at 10 meters. That's about 30 feet. Um, but as you, so if you have a, say a 50 or 50 mile an hour wind at, at uh, 10 meters at the airport, you easily could have 65, 70 mile an hour wind, you know, up, you know, on a mid rise building. So again, if you got air leakage, you know, and you're in a mid rise facility or a high rise facility, think about it. There's going to be a ton of infiltration into that wall. 
Then you've got stack effect. Where do you have stack effect? Probably in elevator shafts, uh, trash chutes. You got all kinds of ways that, that air can migrate, unconditioned air can migrate uh, through a building system. So, uh, you know, stack effects. It, it varies. Like I said, I've got a cold climate and a warm climate. If you want to screenshot those, those are pretty good, pretty good shots. Um, <clears throat> stack effects, another way you get um, unconditioned air into the interior side of a building. So, um, you know, your air, your openings through an attic system. I, I took this, I took this picture several years ago when I was trying to, I was helping an owner. He said, I've got a, I got a bunch of roof leaks and I went on his roof and this roof was like beautiful. And I said, well, we got to figure this out. So we started looking. So this photo I took with flash, right? That's the attic space. That's the uh, attic space uh, without the photo. Now, am I saying attic spaces should be sealed from, from everything? No. But the, so all, all this was showing was this is, you got unconditioned air entering your attic. Here's the problem at, at that house um, or that house, that this building. You can see the insulation here at the bottom. He, he probably had about 30% coverage over his ceiling system. He probably had about 30% coverage of insulation over his ceiling. That means he had 70%, just the ceiling was just the only thing separating the Interior from the exterior was the ceiling grid. And he was getting all kinds of condensation. This was in Georgia too, you know, so he's basically air conditioning, you know, seven to nine months out of the year, right below the ceiling. And then you've got 150 degree, you know, high humidity air up here. So his problem, it looked like his ceiling had all kinds of stains on it. And I was like, well, this is condensation. So see, that looks like a roof leak. It wasn't, it was condensation. This was another, this is another case. Um, this was at a, there's a window above this. This is in a, a mid-rise I worked on several years ago with my building partner or my business partner. And he basically was saying, we, I got a leak. I got a leak at my window. We water tested the window, but this was in litigation. We were water testing the windows. They didn't leak. Um, I told you windows leak. This one, this, it was a real high end window. The window itself and the rough opening above this did not leak. We had proven that with water testing. The, build, the owner was going, I've got a leak here. And we were able to cut the drywall. We cut the drywall and look, the, the insulation had fallen down. So I've got unconditioned, I've got unconditioned air where, where the insulation has fallen down and look, Next photo, I've got an air leak. That's uh, that's daylight coming through that little com coming through that spot. So I had basically unconditioned air coming into the wall cavity, and I had the insulation had dropped down to create unconditioned air space. And so what looked like a window leak was condensation. Um, so that's why this is why air is so important. And this is the this is important. Um, I'm going to cover this in in our um, in a couple in a couple of minutes with some examples. But pressurized buildings, if if the supply and the return systems of the HVAC system are not in balance, um, i.e., uh, let's say the supply system is providing 80. I'm, I'm going to keep this low math, 80 c, uh, cubic feet per minute, and the return fans are pulling 100 uh, cubic feet per minute. That means the supply is only given 80, the returns are sucking 100. That means the 20 is going to be pulled in from wherever, wherever the leaks are. And this is a, a big issue with commercial buildings and probably with some residences. Essentially, if you've got negative air pressure and you've got air leaks, you're just basically being pulling, you're going to pull um, uh, unconditioned air into the building and, and and it's kind of game over. So this is a big issue. Um, 
let's, I'm going to skip that. We've kind of covered this slide. Um, this is a nice slide. It shows you, you know, your air barrier and your uh, is going to move uh, basically depending on where you are in the, in the, in the world, you know, from, you know, Canada uh, has a whole different, their, their condensation issues happen during the winter months. Our condensation down in Georgia happened during the summer months. And that's because of, you know, climate and the HVAC systems that are running inside the uh, buildings. Let's skip this. Let's skip this one. But well, what's important about this is if you've got unconditioned air with a lot of humidity and you've got a dew point temperature of a surface um, that's colder than you know the dew point temperature of the air, bingo. Um, let's let's do this from some photos in a little bit. But that's it. That's important. That's what happens. Permeants. Uh, I teach this class to some other folks. So I'm going to skip a few slides. This is this is related to diffusion. Um, so this is, you know, basically uh, like look at drywall. We'll diffuse 50, 50 perms of moisture um, in an hour. So basically a perm is uh, one grain of water per square foot per hour. If, that, if you think about diffusion, a grain of water is approximately one seven thousandth of a gallon. So, I, I, um, so basically, you see a gypsum wall board is is relatively permeable, right? From a vapor standpoint, uh, that's a built up hot mop roof. We talked about built up roof earlier, right? Zero. That means it won't let any any vapor through it. Masonry, brick will let you know. 0.8 perms, uh, so you know you're going to get 0.8 grains per hour per square foot. So I mean, this is, you know, basically various materials diffuse um, diffuse uh, moisture through their systems at a dependent. It just depends on the rate. So this that's not a bad slide in that in that regard. Um, other other things that can happen. Um, Moisture within construction materials. A new building gets built. We're, we've got some slides coming on this. So a new building gets built. There's a lot of water in the block. That water has to dry. You know, that, that water in the block has to dry out. Um, bathrooms are always humid places, right? Uh, kitchens can be humid places. Uh, let's, let's keep going. So this is some concrete. This is some concrete. Somebody put a, a waterproofing or a, some kind of coating over concrete that was still wet. You see these blisters coming up, right? Or you see adhesion failures of tile or mold under under tile, uh, under carpet tiles. That's because basically that got put down too early. This this coating got put down too early, um, and and basically you had the concrete had not dried yet, so. Um, this is a good slide showing basically how much, you know, typical, uh, how long it takes to dry a building out. And you think about construction, you got wood and block and all kinds of stuff sitting out in the field before it gets installed. It rains, you know, it's been raining all winter here. Uh, you know, so all those materials get wet, then they get installed inside. They've got to dry out, uh, bathroom, you know. Humid, that, that's pretty low hanging fruit, right? Take showers or we cook, you know, gas cooking, gas stoves generate more moisture than not. This doesn't count the steam if you're doing a lot of pasta cooking or whatnot. You know, these are, these are ways moisture gets into spaces. We, we, you know, just by virtue of being, you know, breathing generate, um, moisture inside buildings. I, I, ha I had a case not too long ago in a gym where I was like, this is condensation issue because, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people working out in here anyway. So this is a, you can take a shot of that. Basically, ASHRAE recommends, you know, interior um, humidity between, you know, 40 and 60, that this is a moving target. 
also this is an old slide 1989 they've they've tweaked that some so basically you'll start getting mold growth when you get you know relative humidity inside a inside a building say starting at about 70 or so you you know you, that's when you start having issues uh, you can you can do some modeling that's beyond the scope of this talk today but there's a you can screenshot this I like this this is this is sort of similar to that slide where we had the third of a quart uh, versus uh you know 30 um, quarts you know this is uh you can just this is from a model so this was interior air at 68 and 50 percent relative humidity exterior is colder exterior this is winter in new york basically look at the difference between um just diffusion that blue line is just diffusion through the through the through the assembly right about 0.1 grain you know 0.1 grain that's not, that's nothing compared to a thousand grains remember a thousand grains that'd be one seventh of a gallon coming through a one square inch hole. This is this is uh, uh, Florida uh, during the summer. And I, what's interesting about this is look at the relative humidity on this one is low, 56. I'm like, dude, that should be like 70, 75, 80, you know, but look at, look at how much uh, air, how much moisture comes into the building about the same, about a thousand grains per hour. So, so that so basically it's driving home the point, but there's models you can use to do this. I'm going to skip to some photos because we've got about uh, five minutes to go. This is a building. This is a wood frame building we uh, looked at down in Charleston, South Carolina several years ago. Um, you see uh, I've got a flat roof right here. We had leakage from all sorts of, we had leakage from all sorts of sources on this building. This was this wound up being like a thirty million dollar retrofit. Uh, and when we started looking at these buildings, they were uh, between a year and two and a half, two years old. Ten buildings um, built over a two year period. We started working with the owner at about eighteen months of age. So some of the buildings were like, you know, literally eighteen months old. Some were had just been finished. Um, it was it was horrendous, but I want you to see there's a roof to wall termination right there, right? Where we should have a kick out. There were no kick outs. There's the roof to wall coming up the roof. This is a flat roof. Did you see the parapet wall here? You're seeing the front side. We had, they had, they'd punch scuppers for the uh, parapet wall that weren't integrated right. The stucco contractor at the floor lines had screwed up the, um, the, uh, basically the weep assemblies at the base of each of the floors. So it was a mess. Um, this is what was going on. Do you see these cracks in the stucco? So basically we're getting all this water in, we're getting water in at these, we're getting water in, see the water, see the crack in this column. The basically everything that could go wrong on this job went wrong. Um, the weeps were wrong. The balcony terminations with the wall were wrong. The the uh, water was getting in these columns. And so basically you think about we, this had OSB wall sheathing, right? So basically it swelled. It, when it got wet, it swelled. When it swelled, it started cracking the stucco. You see these cracks? So that's what it looked like all across the whole building. This is what it looked like inside a number of units. This was an apartment complex. That's what, you know, think about yeah, think about that's mold right there that was right right under the uh, you know trim there at the base of the wall. So you can see you can see that's that's water. Um, this is a long shot. That's a close shot. Look at all this damage at these outside corners. They hadn't tied the waterproofing around the corners. So you see, I mean, you know, you can blow these up if you want to. Um, this is this is. I, we knew from cuts and from moisture testing what we were looking at when we took these IR cameras, IR shots. So I thought these are a good way to end. Um, these yellow locations are basically where water is. You can see I've got, I'm at a floor line. You see the, see the water right under the floor line and these outside corners, the photo I just showed you, the damage. 
You see, so basically this is the upper uh, balcony. We had problems with the water. See the, see the water getting into the column below. The column up above is dry. It's up, in, it's up above where no water is getting to it. But as soon as we hit the floor line, little uh, control joint here, or water from the balcony waterproofing tying to the column, you can see how it's getting wet. Pretty interesting. Uh, whoops. Um, that's an outside corner. Um, you can just see, you know, it, it, yeah, I showed you the, the um, damage a second ago. This is another, another column at the balconies. There's another outside corner, but you can see the building. Of course, that's, that's a false positive, right? That's because of attic air and whatnot. But you can see what's going, maybe a little leakage under the windows. Uh, we, had, we had cut the Dickens out of, this, out of these buildings. We had water, water tested, or not water tested. Well, we had water tested, actually. But we, had, we knew what we were looking at when we did this IR. That's why I told you a minute ago, you got to know what you're looking at. Then it's a fantastic tool. So we'd have to cut and take moisture tests all over the place. But you can see, you can see this floor line joint is leaking. This floor line joint's leaking. This window flashing's leaking. This outside corner's leaking. So, I mean, fantastic tool once you once you know what you're doing. I mean, or know what you're looking at. Is that a duplicate? This is a this is a hotel I looked at about a month and a half ago, and we were looking at um, why was water getting in? Well, these they were getting a lot of water at the metal. That's a metal sliding door right there, right? Uh, a lot of water at that location manifested by look at all these uh, tack strips under the carpet. We had mold, rust here. The, reason, the, the reasons were, I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm flying low. You know, basically holes in these, holes in the frame systems, rough opening, obviously not behind that. The rough opening's right behind that, not, not well treated. You know, whole water is going to blow in, come in that little hole there is behind the rough opening. If the rough opening is not treating it right, it's bad. This is the, this is the most important thing. Um, this goes to the negative air pressure. So that's, that's a continuously running um, uh, exhaust vent in the, uh, in the bathrooms, right? When you come to Houston, you're going to have one of these in your room, right? Um, this is what it looked like when I took, I took the, I took the, you know, louver off the front. So basically this is continuously running. I want you to think about this. This is continuously sucking air, right? Because it's, it's exhausting the bathroom. Those things run 24 seven, but do you see how the vent is not tied to the wall? So basically that's sucking air. So it's sucking some air. I'll back up, right? It's, suck, it's, sucking, it's sucking some air right out of the bathroom, correct? Yeah, the rhetorical question for you. But it's also sucking air from wherever it can get. The, the, since this is not uh, tied to the wall, it's sucking air out of the wall assembly too, which is unconditioned air. But wait, there's more. So we went up into the attic and went, okay, we're in the attic. That is the wall you were just looking at. So we've got unconditioned air in the attic, right? 150 degree, ultra high humidity air because the more temperature you've got, the more humidity you've got. So we're sucking this humidity into the, just basically into the wall system. That high humidity air in the wall system is hitting cold drywall we had mold all across this building. Um, this is this is uninsulated uh, cold water pipes up in the attic space, right? So that could look like a roof leak or a ce it'd be a ceiling leak down below this. So insulation's your friend, right? This is another attic space um, in another building. So this is attic space. People go, I got a roof leak. My ceiling, look at that ceiling stain. Well, if you don't have, this is back, back, this is a different attic, but similar, same concept. So you, you see what, you've got to look, you got to understand what goes on. That's the last slide, Rick. It's 332.
Um, it's awesome. We, we, we can take questions if you'd yeah. like. Go for it. Did I, did I just totally destroy y'all's day? <laughs> you know, you're like. Chris, why don't you explain you're, 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 you as a consultant come into these situations and it's kind of like a, you're like a private investigator. You're like, I got to discover how that moisture is getting into the building. Right. I mean, is that, would that be an accurate way to describe it? Or? Yeah, I mean, what we do, I mean, we helped like, you know, I'll go back to this one. This is probably high water mark, but uh, let me, while we're here, this is an emerging issue. Um, this is all wood frame. I, I would say 20 years ago, this would have been, this entire building's wood frame, the entire building. And now you guys are all around the, all around the country. There is more and more wood frame construction being built that's six story. That was 20 years ago, that would never have been. So to answer your question, Rick, in this case, we were working for the owner. The owner was uh, working with their general contractor and the owner, the owner called us and said, we do work for them. We help them kind of as facility engineers for their building, but they know that we're enclosure specialists too. So, and a lot of the problems are enclosure type stuff. So they, they called and said, hey, our contractor's finishing this job. There's cracks in the stucco. We've got some water in some units. Would you help us figure out what's going on? And we wound up working with the, the, um, the consultants. Um, I'm sorry, with the consultants for the general contractor. It was very mature. I love this job because of how mature all parties were. The owner said, we got a problem. The contractor kind of stepped up and went, yep, you do. We, we knew about some of this. You found it. Then they hired a consultant. We hired a consultant or we, we were the consultant, the owner hired a consultant. And the four of us worked through how to fix these buildings. Um, it was, and I told you, it was about a $30 million fix on the 30 million initial, uh, initial construction budget. So think about it. Think about how much money was lost because of all the things that were done wrong. But this is an emerging issue. Um, for you guys on the call, because there's more and more mid-rise wood frame being built and wood frame uh, uh, is more susceptible to damage. Um, you know, I, I think this photo show you, you can you, y'all can see the damage here, right? This was only 18 months old. So, um, so yeah, the answer to Rick's question is we work for owners. We're doing some third party work for contractors. We work for insurance companies on occasion. This could have been a litigation job. We met because of the maturity of those four parties, the owner, the contractor all stepping up, uh, and, and the, the consultants that were both, you know, looking at it and not, uh, picking sides and, just like, we just want to figure out what's broken and figure out how to fix it rather than to try to defend who did what. Da, 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 da. We just sort of, now nah, this is all screwed up. We got to figure out how to fix it. And we did. Um, all right. You see some cracking right there in that one. But um, so the answer is to Rick's question is yes, we wind up working for a, a multitude of clients. Yeah. And our job often is what's broken and how do we fix it? Does anybody else have any questions for Chris? Okay. I sure hope this helps you and I look forward to meeting you in Houston, y'all. Glad you're coming. Um, I have a question, Chris. Would yes. we be able to get these slides on a separate email? Um, uh, let me check. Yeah, the answer is uh, maybe. <laughs> Okay. Maybe I'm I was you... trying to follow along, right? And you know, like yeah. in order to um, make sure that I could digest all the information, I would also want to review, right? Uh, I mean, like I would review the video as well. But if I could also read the slides, that would be quite helpful. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see what I can do. I might have to leave a few photos out of some of the some of these because they're. Um, 
I don't want to, I don't want a client going, Hey, why is my building, you know, there, but, um, but no worries, slides, thank you. you're talking about the written slides. Yeah. Yes. Answers. Let me, let me, let me figure out how to do that. And Rick, and I'll figure out how to get it to you. Okay. Well, awesome. Everybody, um, well, thanks. Let's thank, thank Chris if you could unmute. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> he's so used to all be, you all being so quiet. So. Yeah, I'm looking you, for Chris. Um, which booth will you be on at the show? Let's, I'll be all around. I'll be, okay. I, I'm, I'm not presenting, but I'll, I'll moderate a few of our technical sessions. Mm -hmm. And then one of you, I might be, you know, one on one mentor, mentee. Um, but we'll, I bet we'll all see each other. Please come up and say hello. I will. I've, sure. I've done as far as the mentorship programs go. Sometimes, you know, you're there and I'm, and you, you know, you're an architect or you're an engineer and I might could go, Hey, this session will, you'll really get, and it'll really help you in your development as a student. Uh, this session is going to be, you know, high math and something you're not going to deal with until later on, or, you know, maybe never, um, if that's the right way to say it. Uh, both of, uh, my first year, uh, I had an architect, he's practicing in New York City. And last year, I had a, a structural engineer who's working for a building and closure company in Houston, Texas. And both of them was able to say, hey, let's, let's go to this class rather than that class, because I think it'll help you as a student. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but come yeah. up, come speak to me. And one of you possibly either now watching the call or later on the recording, one of, one of you'll be my one-on-one, -on -one, you know, mentee and I'll be your mentor, but come up and speak to me and I'll be, I'll be glad to help you in any way I can just as Rick will also. Awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the uh, recording now. Good. We managed to almost do it right on time. So thanks. Thanks for putting.